The Bitter Side of Sweet, Chapter 22 I crouch there, listening until she's done with her call and has slumped at the table. Then I sneak around the house and slip in through the door to the front of the room, where I'm supposed to be asleep. For a few minutes I lie there and stare at the ceiling, trying to get my racing heart to slow. Finally, unable to bear it alone anymore, I let myself into Khadijah's room without knocking. Khadijah leaps up. I was right. She's not asleep either. Instead, she's sitting on her bed, rebraiding her hair into tight, straight lines and staring out her window. What are you looking at? Just checking, she says, sinking back onto the mattress and glancing out. I see that through her window, she has a clear view of the gate. Fabrice, absent a few minutes ago when I did my lap of the house, is now leaning in the open door jam, chatting to Sandrine, who seems to be leaving again, and we can see go into the street beyond. There are people passing by, and others linger in small groups, having conversations. I scan them all automatically, looking for the nephew, but I don't see him anywhere. Then again, since I don't know who else I should be looking for, that one absence is not very comforting. Did you see anything? No, she says. Her tone makes me think she doesn't know what she's looking for either. But I still can't fall asleep. I remember Mrs. Kaplan holding Khadijah as soon as she got her back, saying, You're all right. Looking at her now, surrounded by her things, wearing a clean yellow shirt and navy skirt, braiding her hair, even with all that, I can see that she's not all right. Her eyes are still a little, a little hollow, her smile still a little slow. She pauses before she leaps now, calculating the possible cost. This is not the same Khadijah who left this house. Getting home did not make her all right. I wonder whether she will ever be all the way right again. I sigh and push away thoughts of what it will be like to take Sadu home to Molly. It hurts too much to think that, after all this work, there may be some journeys that you just never come home all the way from. Khadijah rubs her forehead. I keep feeling like any second someone could come here and take me again. Well, you won't need to worry about that far too much longer, I say scowling. You're going to France tomorrow. What? Her hands drop from her hair. I heard your mama talking on the phone to someone, and she's making plans to get out of here. Khadijah gapes. Plans for two. I can't help but add bile churning in my stomach. Not four. What? Is that all you're going to say? I snap. I, I don't understand why she wouldn't tell me. How should I know why she isn't telling you? I slump on the end of her bed and sink my head into my hands. I know why she's not telling us. She's no kin to us and doesn't care about us, but that doesn't make it any better. I know I should stop talking, but the words keep trickling out. You said... You promised that she would help us get home, and now Sadu and I are going to be left behind to fend for ourselves in an Ivorian town we don't know. I wish I'd never listened to you. I wish we'd never come here with you. Shut up. I wish we'd never met you. I finally make myself stop talking. A silence puddles around us, and I wish I could take back what I said. It's just all so hard, and I'm so, so tired. I finally look up. Khadijah's looking at me, but her eyes hide whatever she's feeling. Come on, she finally says and gets to her feet. Where are you going? I'm done trying to figure out what's going on by myself. Face set, she pulls open her door and heads toward the kitchen. I scramble after her. That didn't work before. We're going to go talk to Mama. I follow her half-braided head. She's not letting me catch up. Are you sure that's a good idea? I spare a moment, since I'm already worrying, to worry about Sadu waking up and finding me gone. Other than the few nights on the farm when we were punished with sleeping separately, we've never been apart. I don't want him to wake alone in this strange house and panic. You made sure I got home, Khadijah says. I'm sure as hell going to do the same for you. A step ahead of me, Khadijah stomps into the kitchen. Her mother whirls around, clicking her phone shut. Khadija, she says, smiling, not sounding pleased at all. Amadou, you're awake. What are you two doing? Khadija's chin goes up, trying to figure out why you're lying to us.
For a moment, there's silence. Then Mrs. Coblin's false happiness peels off her face like bark struck from the tree. The looks she and Khadija exchange make the room crackle like the air before a lightning storm. Now I know where the wildcat got her temper. Then Khadija's mother looks away. The silent war has ended. I'm not lying to you, she says softly. I have never lied to you. I'm only trying to keep you safe. Well, that didn't really work either, did it? Whispers Khadija. I'm horrified at her rudeness, but her mother crosses the room in three steps and scoops her into her arms. I know, I know. I'm trying to fix it, she whispers, her ruined fingers stroking the sides of her daughter's face. By taking me to France and not telling me? Khadija pulls away. Mrs. Kaplan goes still. By abandoning Amadou and Seydou? By pretending nothing ever happened? It did happen, and they matter to me. And you can't just keep hiding everything. I deserve to know. We deserve to know what's going on. I lick my lips, worried that Khadija has pushed too far and gotten us in trouble. It would only take one angry word from Mrs. Coblin, and Sadu and I would be out on the street. Whether Khadija liked it or not, there would be very little she could do about it. Mrs. Coblin sinks into one of the kitchen chairs and covers her face with her hands. Then she gets control of herself. She looks at us carefully, measuringly. Amadou, she finally says with a sigh, please go to my room. On the table by my bed, you'll see a pile of papers, a large brown envelope, and a small notebook. Could you bring them here? Happy for the chance to move, I leave the kitchen. There's only one door that I haven't seen open yet, the one in between Khadija's and the, be and the bathroom. I decide it must be Mrs. Coblin's room. I glance at Sadu, but he's still fast, fast asleep. Opening the door, I see the things I'm looking for on the table beside the bed, where she said they would be. As I cross the room to get the papers, I run my blunt fingers over tiny vials of makeup and perfume on the dresser, brush my calluses over the silky touch of the pile of clothes stacked on a chair. I briefly wonder what it would cost me to have given this kind of finery to my mother when she was alive, but I can't imagine the numbers that must be attached, and every one of them would matter. And anyway, thinking about numbers makes me remember other numbers that matter, like how few coins remain from the money we stole from the bosses, and how few hours are left before Mrs. Coblin takes Khadija to France. I squeeze my eyes shut to block all the numbers out, then pick up the pile of papers and head to the kitchen. By the time I get there, Khadija's sitting on a chair next to her mother, and they have their arms around each other. I guess they used the time I was gone to get rid of any hard feelings left between them. I'm glad. I put the pile on the table in front of Mrs. Coblin and take the seat across from them. She gives her daughter one more quick hug and a kiss on the forehead, and then she lets go of her to reach for the papers. She opens the notebook, and I see that it is filled with small, neat handwriting and pencil sketches. I can't read what any of it says, of course, but I recognize some of the things shown in the sketches. Pods, seeds, trucks, drying flats, docks. Then she reaches into the large envelope. It's filled with pictures. Mrs. Coblin fans them out in front of us on the table, then sits back to let us have a look. There are clear photos of cacao trees, the pods, the seeds, a brown, dark brown powder, and shiny, colorful packages of candy. Then there are blurry pictures, ones that are difficult to make out, of people far away working in fields and at the docks. Khadija holds up one of the blurry pictures. What's this even of, she asks. Her mother shrugs ruefully. Mobile phone pictures don't make very good evidence. Phone pictures, I ask. Phones are for talking. I don't understand how now all of a sudden they're giving Mrs. Coblin pictures, too. Yes, says Khadija, like this. She lifts her mother's phone from the table. She points it at me and presses one of the buttons. Then she turns the phone around so I can see it. There on the screen is a picture of my face. It's grainy and dark and the colors are slightly off, but it's definitely me. It makes a sick feeling churn in my belly, though I can't quite put my finger on why. Khadija's moved on from taking pictures of me, focusing again on the photos in front of us. 
So what is all this? She asks. Her mother turns on the electric light that hangs from the ceiling, banishing the evening shadows that had begun to settle around us. This is the report I've been working on, she says. This is the reason they want me shut up before I can pub publish it. This is why you were taken. Khadijah and I stare blankly at the pile of pictures on the table in front of us. For a moment, Khadijah flips through the notebook. Then she takes a comb out of her pocket and continues braiding from where she left off, as if she can't stand for her fingers to be idle when her brain is churning. I don't understand, I admit. Well, Khadijah's mother sighs, I don't really understand it either. But the truth of the matter is that this country's main export is cocoa. And the chocolate lords will do a lot to make sure that the story of how it's grown doesn't get out. Wait, chocolate? Khadijah's face is slack with surprise, her fingers frozen mid-movement on top of her head. This is about chocolate? I glance over. What's chocolate? I ask. I thought we were growing cacao. You've never even tasted chocolate, Khadijah's mother says, shaking her head. That's just not right. Here. She pushes herself away from the table. Let me give you something to taste while we talk. She pours milk into a small pot and starts to heat it. Then she adds sugar and a dark powder. After a few minutes, an amazing smell reaches me. What's she making? I whisper to Khadijah. It's hot chocolate, she says. Mama always made it for me as a little girl when I couldn't sleep. Khadijah's mother pulls the saucepan off the flame and pours a steaming liquid into three mugs. Try it and tell me what you think, she says. I lift the mug up to my face and breathe in the rich steam. Then I take a long sip. Khadijah's mother gives a soft laugh at the look on my face. The liquid is deep and dark and sweet and bitter. It's hot and rich and tastes like comfort and secrets. I imagine what it would be like to have this waiting for me every time I couldn't sleep. It's good, isn't it? Khadijah's mother says with a sad smile, tasting her own mug. For a few minutes, we slip in silence. Then she says musingly, you know, it's not really true that you've never had chocolate before. Maybe not in its refined form, but I'm sure you must have had at least tried the seeds, didn't you? She asks, looking at me with interest. Didn't you ever try the beans in the pods you picked? For a moment, I'm not sure why she's changed the subject. But then I think through what she's saying and a cold feeling enters me. Wait, I say, you think that the pods we were growing on Musa's farm make this? No, you're wrong. That was cacao. Yes. Mrs. Coblin says, you were growing cacao, but that's what they make cocoa and chocolate from. Once the beans are fermented and dried, they get shipped out to other countries, where they're roasted and ground into a paste that they turn into cocoa solids and cocoa butter. Then big companies take the solids and the butter and make it into every kind of chocolate. Chocolate bars for snacking on, chocolate for baking, chocolate fillings, frostings, hot chocolate, they even use it sometimes in hand creams and such. I'm staring at her trying to process what she's saying. You mean, you mean that for the last two years we were kept on that farm to grow something that's a treat for city kids who can't sleep? Mrs. Coblin nods, staring into the creamy swirls of her hot chocolate. I look into mine too, but the taste has changed in my mouth. Now I know the secrets of the dark, sweet liquid in my cup. The smell washes over me again, and this time I gag on it. It's no longer the smell of a loving bedtime routine, but the smell of pain and working for no pay and not being able to go home. It's the taste of Sadu with only one arm, and I can't get it out of my mouth. I push the mostly full mug across the table away from me. I think I'm done, I say. I don't want mine either, Khadijah says beside me. I can understand that, says Mrs. Coblin. These beans were grown on a farm that I know not far from here, where no children worked without pay to grow it. But I can still see why you wouldn't want it. We stare at her blankly. Chocolate, says Khadijah's mother, rubbing her temples as if she's getting a headache just talking about all this. Chocolate doesn't have to be grown the way you were growing it. 
On small farms, yes, that's the only way cacao will grow. But sometimes farmers make enough to pay their workers a fair wage for their labor. It's just not the way that a lot of the chocolate in the world is grown. Usually the big companies make huge profits, the middlemen in Abigin get fat off the taxes, and the farmers make next to nothing. Her tired eyes meet mine. And so the farmers find workers they don't have to pay. Usually those workers are children. I remember how Khadijah thought the boss's house was so small and run down. It's true that compared to the houses I've seen, the boss's house was more of a shack. They didn't eat all that much better than us boys, and they worked alongside us too. I try to imagine what it would have been like to work on a different kind of farm, but can't. Then another thought hits me. Do you mean to say that kids are being forced to work on cacao farms everywhere? Not only where we were, I ask. Thousands, she says, gripping her mug with her abused fingertips. But I'm having a lot of trouble finding all the information I need for my article. Some of the children working are family members of the farmers, or say they are, and others work but can still go to school. It's hard to get a good count of how many children are being kidnapped and forced to work against their will. And once the cocoa cartel bosses got an idea that I was working on a chocolate piece, they began to threaten me, and the people who were willing to talk to me before suddenly stopped talking or disappeared. I was in the process of getting us out of the country because it was becoming too dangerous, but then they took you. Her voice breaks and she reaches across the table and strokes Khadija's cheek. I couldn't leave then, even to go home to Abijan, because I had to hope that you were alive and that if I was quiet and stopped working like they told me to, I'd get you back. I've been offering money to everyone I can think of for information on where you'd gone, and I wouldn't leave San Pedro because it was the place you would know where to find me. She stares into Khadija's eyes. When her hand drops to the table, it curls into a fist. I care a great deal about the injustices of chocolate, but not at the expense of your safety. Now that you're back, I'm going to get you out of here before they can find you again. From the beginning, I've tried everything I could think of to keep you safe. You don't know how sorry I am that it didn't work. Khadija's staring at her mother, but I'm stuck on something Mrs. Coblin just said. Wait a minute, I break in. If the Coco people have so much power, why do you think we're safe here? This is where they kidnapped Khadija from before. Well, says her mother, spreading her hands, they don't know she's here, and they've left me alone while she's been gone. The only people who have seen you are Fabrice, Sandrine, and the doctor, all of whom I trust, so there's no reason to think that they'll come here again. A horrible, prickling feeling creeps up my spine and digs its claws into the back of my neck. I suddenly realize why I'm upset that phones can take pictures. I reach out and grab Khadijah's hand. But Khadijah, I say, squeezing her arm, I think they do know that you're here. Mrs. Coblin's head whips around to me. What? she asks. We caught a ride on a truck, I explain, and it dropped us here. I shuffle through the pictures until I find the shadowy one up the dock. When we got out, one of the guards followed us. But when he found us, I think he took a picture of us with his phone. Khadija's looking at me like I just announced that I want to be a cacao boss when I grow up. My stomach churns. I didn't want to make you more scared last night, so I didn't tell you then. But don't you see? I shake her arm again. The man who followed us last night works at the docks that are run by the chocolate people. Once he had your picture, he went away again. The only way that makes sense is if he knew where to find you later. For a moment, Khadija and her mother both stare in silence. Then Mrs. Cablin bolts out of her chair, pulling Khadija with her. We have to get out of here now, she says, dragging her to the bedrooms. Go, get your shoes on. I'll get the passports and some money. Meet me at the front door. No, Khadija and I both say at the same time. This is not a joke, her mother snaps at us. Move, now. What about Amadou and Saidu? Khadija asks. Her mother's eyes are glazed with fear, but she focuses on me again for a moment. Go get your brother, she says, and hurry. You'll have to come with us. 
We'll figure out where we're all going once we're out of this house. I pound into the front room, not waiting for her to change her mind and leave us here in San Pedro. I run to where Sadu is still asleep on the floor and grab him into my arms, blankets and all. He thrashes awake. Let go of me, he screeches. Shh, Sadu, it's me. I shove the blankets away and grab his right hand. Come on, we need to run. Be quiet. Instantly awake, Sadu follows me without another sound. When I get to Khadija's mother's bedroom, I see her shoving papers from a desk drawer into a satchel. Where's the medicine Sandrine bought for Sadu? I ask. On the table by the front door, she says over her shoulder. Her movements are jerky, panicked. I run. Sure enough, on the little table by the front door, I see a small brown paper bag. When I pick it up, it rattles. I take a moment to look inside and check. It's medicine. I shove the bag in my pocket. I can still hear Khadija and her mother shouting at each other about what to take or not take, and I'm considering what food I should grab from the kitchen when the lights go off. Though Sadu's next to me and I know that Khadija and her mother are only steps away, the sudden darkness makes me feel like I'm completely alone. Fear does that. I grab Sadu tight against me. I can hear Mrs. Coblin whispering Khadija's name and the shuffling footsteps of the two of them in the dark. There's nothing to worry about, I whisper to Sadu, trying to make myself believe it. Just as, the, just as the words leave my mouth, I hear a click from behind me, and the front door swings open. <laughs>